see, as you can see, in compared to the breast, where almost it will be sta stabilized in 2025, they expected that they will go high in terms of the mortality. Now, we in uh, United States data in 2016, as you can see, the incidence is directly correlated with the mortality per year. So almost 10.9% of the patients high, and the male 14.1, and as you can see, 12.5. So the incidence is directly indicated with the mortality. The problem with pancreatic cancer, there is a lot of mutations and there was a rule of stromal developmental. And as you can see, unfortunately, we don't have a clear data about the genetic of uh, the pancreatic cancers. And in nature 2017, they expected that's a normal, then going to pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia one and two and three. And finally, it will have the metastatic disease and what's called pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So in nature also 2016, based on the genetic and transcription factors, they randomize or they classify our pancreatic cancer to four types, squamous type, pancreatic prognosis types, apparently differentiated endocrine, exocrine subtype, and immunogenic subtypes. And this actually based on the genes and based on the transcription factors. However, it is not clinically validated. So, as we say, there is a lot of mutation landscape, and it's a very complex, raising from DNA repair to the keras to chromatin, and this is very important to us because they try a lot of medications working against this gene and mutation, and unfortunately, we'll know the answer later on. Now, one of the characteristic features of pancreatic cancer, it's called what's the role of microenvironment. We concentrated a long time ago on the cancer cells and T cells. However, if you look microscopically for the patient with pancreatic cancer, you will see dense infiltrations with a lot of cells coming, fibroblasts, B cells, uh, and also uh, extracellular matrix. And this is always will give the tumor uh, activated and uh, will have genetic diversity. And the tumor stromal, as we said before, it's carrying a lot of things from stromal cell immune regulators and stromal signaling and finally extra uh, cellular matrix. Now, we know clearly that pancreatic cancer is not one disease. At least we have four diseases starting from the resectable disease, borderline resectable, and locally advanced unresectable and metastatic disease. And if you can see most of other patients, this is actually worldwide uh, incidence. 70% of those, they have an, uh, an, an advanced stage. And as you can see, the survival in five years is zero, zero, indicating the high mortality, very devasta devastating prognostic uh, disease. So we know the local disease, and I'm sure my colleague in the surgery, they are going to speak to about it. What's the definition of potentially resectable, borderline, and locally advanced? And let's go and look for the potentially resectable uh, disease. Now, if you look all the data here from Ryan in 2014, England Journal of Medicine, when he collect all the data, GITCG, the trial of American people, 43 patients, they randomized observations, both surgery or five view radiotherapy, and it showed an overall survival, 43 patients only. And after that, we have another two important trial, which is SPAC-1 and CONCO-1, and both of them showed clearly there is uh, no benefit from radiation therapy and only the benefit came mainly from the chemotherapy. Now, if you look to the CONCO trial, the uh, overall survival is 20 and 10%, almost 10% difference. This is the first five years, and you can see after 10 years, the incidence is going down to almost 5%, indicating also those patients, they will have recurrence even after five years. However, if you do see the subsequent analysis for uh, the free disease free survival and overall survival, and I would like from the group to concentrate, those who has an R1, they gain the most benefits of the response to the chemotherapy. And... Uh, 
if you see the overall survival, uh, the hazard ratio of the disease progression survival was 33. And if you look for overall survival was 0.66 for those who has an R1 positive tumors. Now, in the last year, the, uh, we have a new standard of care where a restricted pancreatic adenocarcinoma, randomized to gemcitabine alone, or gem plus kepcitabine is back four, and the overall survival was four years. And the matter of fact, it gives us almost three month survival, changing our practice to this is a standard of care. And if you see the SBAC1, the CONCO trial, and also the VIVE SBAC3, all of those, you can see the survival is almost 20 months. Now, the most striking actual information here, and I would like the group to uh, concentrate it. Now, in R1, BOR1, which is positive restriction margin, we don't have any gain for the patient with combination therapy. However, if you see on R0, there was almost more than, we are speaking now roughly of 10 to 12 month overall survival, which is huge for those who has an R0. This is exactly opposite to the CONCO trial, where the most benefit driven from the R1 uh, uh, category of patients. Now, if you look, is there the question here, is there any role for radiation therapy for the patient who has completely resected? Going back in 2005 for the meta-analysis, show those patients who has an R1 actually in favor of giving chemo radiation therapy. Are we going to stop there? The answer is definitely no. There is a lot of trial going in, and we will see it in within one or two years from now, where the randomized NAVBAC or gemcitabine to gemcitabine alone, or m or fulfornix chemotherapy to gemcitabine, and we are uh, waiting for the result. So for the summary of adjuvant therapy, I do believe, and we can uh, ask ourselves later on, for, for the R0 patient, we should use gemcitabine as standard of care, gemcitabine for unfit patients, and for R1, I do believe we should implement the radiation therapy in our protocol, or basically give gym, uh, gym chemotherapy alone, not the gym cap. So what about the borderline resectable patients? We have a lot of tons and tons of the clinical trial. It's basically uh, this, uh, retrospective, and actually we have a lot of conflicted results, and it's only was based on center experience. As you can see, the meta-analysis, they did a lot of meta-analysis for those category of patients, and it showed some activity in the borderline with 10 to 30 percent resectability rate. The now in the locally advanced non-resectable patient, actually the most important questions to ask ourselves, what type of chemotherapy that gives the most benefit in terms of the response rate? And based on the metastatic disease, we can see the best chemotherapy combination actually was, was with the full foreignx, which is almost giving 31%. One third of the patient, they will have a response. Now, Dr. Philip, uh, in two, this year, uh, published his data in Annals of Oncology, where 110 of unresectable patients, they have induction phase with NAB, gemcitabine, and after that, they will assist the patient either to go for NAB, gem, or chemo radiations or surgical resections. The most interesting thing with this combination, 33% they have some sort of partial therapy and almost up to 20% or uh, sorry, up to 40% actually, they have uh, almost uh, respond aim and those patients was compared to, to surgical resections. And as you can see, almost 7% Seven patients actually they have complete R0 resection with a very, uh, I mean, very safe combinations in terms of the side effects. Now, there was a meta analysis by Dr. Tsukair when he collected all the data of Fulfornix as an induction therapy. And as you can see, the response rate actually is reaching up to almost 30% uh, as a therapy, as a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, this is a real experience from uh, Ontario in Canada, where they have almost 90 patients of locally advanced. They receive all foreign chemotherapy, 40 
patients, they receive not baclitaxel, and 17 actually they receive gemcitabine. And uh, interestingly, even the highest was definitely with uh, Polforinix with second not baclitaxel, but even the gemcitabine, which always we think it's a placebo, they have two patients that they underwent for the section. This is a real data from uh, Ontario, Canada. So the big question is, what's the role of radiation therapy? And clearly, the survival was demonstrated clearly with chemo radiation over the chemotherapy alone. And the doctor, uh, in the scallop trial, where they give induction of chemotherapy with gym cap, and after that, they randomized the patient to keep cytopene or gym cytopene. And a matter of fact, it showed clearly that uh, kipcitabine was less toxic than gemcitabine with the chemo radiations and was also one year overall survival 15.2 compared to 13.4, favoring kipcitabine in scallop trials. Now, what about the chemotherapy followed chemo radiations? So, give the patient to start with the chemotherapy inductions, and if the patient shows stable disease, go with the chemo radiations. And a matter of fact, if you go with the chemo radiation therapy, you can see uh, the difference is almost four months with a very significant B value. This is a very old trial in 2007. So the big question is actually, what is the most important to use, gemcitabine alone or gem plus erlotinib? And this is, was in lab 07. And what's the benefit between chemotherapy and chemo radiations, and the matter of fact, there was no difference between the two. However, the number of patients was uh, almost 233. Are we going to stop there? Is the answer is no. We have a lot of treatments in locally advanced, starting with the chemotherapy, either with forfornix or nabbaclitaxel, and after that, those patients uh, were randomized to chemo radiation or chemotherapy, and we will find the results hopefully within two to three years from now. So, in the summary of both locally advanced and borderline, we don't have a solid data of phase three. Most study, as we said, there was some increment in the rate of R0 restrictions, and it was very old chemotherapy and less effective and single center uh, experience. We do believe that induction therapy followed by chemo radiation is the most appropriate for this patient, and always, always, always discuss your case in multidisciplinary uh, approach. So this is my approach, a sharp approach, and I need to keep it in your mind. So combination chemotherapy, and after that restaging, and if the patient is resectable, go for surgery and then adjuvant therapy. If he's not resectable and stable disease, I go and better my colleague in uh, radiation department to give chemo radiation therapy. And if the patient progress, definitely I will send them for Professor Ashwag to deal with these cases. So the most important now, what about the metastatic disease, which is almost we have 40% of our populations. Now we know going back in 1997, this is my birthday by the way, in 1997, yeah. So if you see, they did not put in their mind the, clean, the overall survival. The primary endpoint of this trial, of Boris trial, was the clinical benefits. <laughs> They did not aim or look for the overall survival, and they were not expected that they will find any overall survival benefit. However, if you see the one-year survival was dramatically 18% in one year with gemcitabine and 2% in five view, making the gemcitabine is the cornerstone for any treatment with metastatic uh, pancreatic cancers. After that, we have a lot of medication came with all the combination that we know, starting from the chemotherapy, then followed by targeted therapy, and a matter of fact, it was not beneficial. Even the gemcitabine TOSH trial plus erlotinib, when they compare to gemcitabine alone, it gives us almost two weeks, making eliminating the use of uh, erlotinib from the treatment scheme. Now, the fall for next chemotherapy, which is a very clear study, and it showed the response rate to 31 months, and we reached to the overall survival of 11 months, and we never had this before in metastatic disease. And if you see the side effect, unfortunately, 45% they have neutropenia, 5.4% they have febrile neutropenia, and fatigability and GI symptoms. Now, the second trial, actually, nabbaclitaxel, when they compared to gemcitabine, 
give us almost uh, almost two to three month improvement in overall survival. And again, we think it's a very safe medication. However, if you see the neutropenia is almost uh, 38% compared to the 45, which is still high. And if you see the risk of fibrinal neutropenia is again 3%. As well as the risk of thrombocytopenia was very high, 13%, and also the risk of peripheral neuropathy, 30, 17 months, which is much higher than the fulfillment chemotherapy. However, the most important thing in this uh, two trial, if you see the median age for fulfillment, they include only those who has the age of mo most of the trial, 70%, they have their age below uh, 65 and only one third they include in six, more than 65. However, in gym cap cytopene, they didn't include also the patient up to 75. Now, if you see the performance status with the full fornix, they include zero to two. However, in lab baclitaxel, they reach to up to 60% based on Kolfornsky uh, scale. Now, 42%, they use the growth factor in this trial with full fornix and gym cytopene almost 26%. Now, we have four trials, the gemcitabine, the initial trial, the second trial, gem plus erlatinib, and we say it's deleted. Then we have 2010 full foreign next chemotherapy, and give us all for the first time 11 month overall survival, which we never had it before. And finally, NAB backlink, gemcitabine, give us almost two month overall survival benefits. Now, in terms of, uh, I collect all this data, if you can see the response rate with a full foreign next one third of the patient, they will have an excellent response. And if you can see in one year with a full foreign next chemotherapy, almost half the patient still surviving and decrease to uh, 35 with the uh, paclitaxels and 23 and 18 with gemcitabine alone. So what's my first line approach for completely healthy muscular patients? I usually recommend for foreign next chemotherapy for the borderline patient, I include gemcitabine, nab, baclitaxels, and for unfit patient, actually, I go with gemcitabine or actually be supportive care. Now, what about the second line therapy? If you see the second, the trend in the second line therapy, it's increasing from 38 in the second line and 12% at the third line from 2006 to almost 2015. As you can see, the doubling from 12 to 22 and from 38 to 56, making the trend is increasing for second line treatment. The second line treatment, unfortunately, till today at 11 o'clock, we have only those who has both gemcitabine and they include those who has arenitecan or oxaloplatinum. In the Conco trial, 168, they randomized to off chemotherapy, off it's a 5 u Oxaloplatinum, and this is like a dose dense with 5 few lycovorin. And a matter of fact, it showed an overall survival with a significant uh, B value. However, when they compared gemcitabine to Polfox chemotherapy, there was actually a decremental effect with use of Polfox chemotherapy, and 5 few lycovorin was better than uh, Polfox. We don't know why. However, we think it's because of the dose. Uh, change it. Now, Napoli trial, when they uh, look for arenitecan, patients with gemcitabine progress, they start to uh, give arenitecans, uh, liposomal arenitecan, or via viulocovorin, and they did include also three arm, which is, again, they add the combination together, and for the first time, we have clear overall survival with two months and we reached to 6.1 month with a very significant B value in terms of overall survival, as well as almost doubling in the progression free survival. However, keep in your mind those include the patient who progress in gym cytopene alone. And I do believe most of us here in this room that they are not using gym cytopene alone in most of the cases. And this is actually the collecting data of the three trial and look for the Napoli trial where. There was a doubling in progression-free survival, some improvement in CONCO trial, and was negative with Bancaric, uh, uh, Infl, <clears throat> Fox and Vivulocovorin. And if you can see the overall survival 
was 9.9 .9 with my fuel covering compared to six months, making the uh, experimental arm is incremental to be used. So in the first line, if we use gemcitabine, nap back late axles, I think we should shift it to the fine view in the second lines. And if we start with a patient with full foreign chemotherapy, I do believe we should shift it to the gemcitabine. We don't have any very, very strong evidence for that. So what about the future of pancreatic cancer? As we say, there is a lot of I mean, a lot of trial going on targeting this gene or that gene. And clearly, if you see that in the last two years, there was almost more than 10 medications with a lot of targeting factor. And most of this was completely failed in terms of progression-free survival or overall, respond, uh, overall survival rate. What are the current active uh, trial in metastatic pancreatic cancer? The BDL1 tested, BDL1 with high MSI, which is only carrying 1%. So that you should ask yourself, shall we do the I mean, MSI for all the patients with pancreatic cancers? I do believe I will not do it. And basically, bimbrolizumab showed some activity on those as an MSI, and the trial was not only for pancreatic cancer, they didn't include colon cancer, lung cancer, and all the cancer that we know, and it's only 1%. Number two, the BRCA mutation was almost 5%, and the STAT3 and hydronan, and we are going to discuss this in a minute. So the BARP inhibitor and the BARC, uh, BRCA uh, uh, antagonist, we have a lot of medication going on in phase one and phase two trials, and hopefully we'll see the result in coming two years. Now, the hydro, uh, the hydronine, which is actually, it's available in our uh, normal body, in the skin, and basically in, uh, in the joint, and it's making the gel. This gel, when attached to the fibroblast, it will compress the vessels and decrease the delivery of the treatment therapy to the cells, and Dr. Philip presented this data in uh, 2017, and as you can see, there is almost four month uh, improvement in progression free survival. This leads exactly to a phase three trial, and we hope the hydronan that it will be a diagnostic as well as a predictive biomarker in metastatic pancreatic cancers. Dr. Saab also, uh, uh, he was looking for the trial of NAB boxing and NAB uh, boxing. And basically, it is anti stat 3 which is exactly stem cells. So it's called anti -stimony. And basically, it is, we know, the stem cells, they carry a lot of resistance, and they try to target it anti stat 3 to reduce this resistance. And he randomized gym, NAB back cells again, to uh, with or without NAP vaccines. And as you can see, the progression free survival of 66 patients was almost seven months. And the median overall survival was 10.7. And uh, basically, we have phase three going on at the mean times. So, my dream after one year from now, you will find a physician and the patient and the physician he will say to the patient you have been diagnosed as a metastatic pancreatic cancers and the patient you, and the physician he will say your care rate cure rate sorry is almost 95 and the patient he will say okay i can swallow that and matter of fact at that time dr ashwag she was she will lock actually from the door and uh, her answer what are they speaking about so basically, if you see the pancreatic cancer is a very devastating disease with high mortality rate, and there is actually slight improvement in the last 25 years. And as we said, it is a very heterogeneous disease with a lot of mutations. And uh, <clears throat> I do believe all the cases of locally advanced, resectable, and borderline should be discussed in multidisciplinary tumor. I do believe that the <clears throat> usual radiation, external beam radiation, it, it will be eliminated soon with SBRT uh, technique. And basically, there is a lot of ongoing trials. I think magnetic cancer, uh, it's very devastating and very disappointing. A lot of trial came in the last two or three years, and all the trial came as completely negative. Until today, we don't have any excellent medication for uh, pancreatic cancer. 
And basically, lastly, we are still lacking the predictive factors and hopefully the HALO9 of Dr. Philip, it will be the first predictive marker. I do believe with this I'm going to end and thank you so much. <laughs> yes, so uh, let me ask Dr. Shoki first, and then we'll come and we'll, I will answer your questions. Shoki, in R1 positive pancreatic cancers, are you including Jim Kip cytobine as a standard of care? Yes. In spite of its negative in, in the trials? An R1 patient, they did not benefit from the, which is almost 40%. I think they were included, and the whole panel was positive, so I would think that. You'll include. Uh, Ashwag? <coughs> yes, it was pre planned. It was pre planned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, I do believe, as Ashwag mentioned clearly, that the most important combination therapy it is gemcitabine and kipcitabine in pancreatic cancers. However, you should ask yourself why we give an adjuvant therapy for a metastatic colorectal cancer, for uh, colon cancer, CHD colon cancer. We know that almost 50% they will have a recurrence. And we have a clear evidence that it's given us a three month overall survival benefit. So I'll give it to the patient and I will cross my, ha uh, my hand or my leg <laughs> and I will see what I should do. A matter of fact, so our fingers. And uh, I will see what I should do. A matter of fact, I, uh, I will give the patient all the therapy and they will see. Any more questions? Well, you put a very nice slide about the second line uh, treatment, all three. Uh, yeah. And you see the, uh, uh, the discussion on was actually equal in the uh, Napoli, in the overall survival, mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, COVID 3, and in the Pentagon. So you have consistency in the. Discussion. Regardless of. Yes. You're completely right, Chauki, but this is the result of the tri their trials. I don't believe they are very highly select. I think they have very high selecting, uh, I mean, selections, selection bias, but I don't know why. Like, you are completely right. 9.9. We did not reach it even in the first line. Uh, in the first line, we did not, I mean, only the polyphonic chemotherapy. So five year local ovarian, the trial, all the trial was, I mean, 2% in the first years. So uh, it is a data, Shawki, I cannot ignore this. But the most important thing that's giving us an idea that polyphonic chemotherapy, I do believe we should not use a second line therapy and patients who progress in gemcitabine. I think we should use off chemotherapy. We are in our center, we are, we are using off chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very toxic, I know, but we use it, we use it. We don't have a good result, you're completely right, but we still use it. Victor? Yeah, again, the I see these people most of the times first or second biopsy them the AOR. But so I get this patient now and you're presenting this data to me as like the first one 
become an innovation. How would you hold the discussion with this patient now? With this data, all this data on the table, we just like, there's some subjectivity I see now. I mean, and then choosing which surgeon to which end. How, how, how would you make your decision? I mean, do you hold the discussion with, with your patient? I really am well. This table now, even I can see as professionals, we start to doubt some of the number there. I mean, it's not an easy decision. I don't know. Or if you turn the subjective in this one, I think the patient is really <coughs> just like. Yes. So it's an excellent question. Thank you. So uh, I do believe you should sit with your patient, understand what the patient wants, look for the, his performance status, look for, I mean, how is he going to respond to the, your chemotherapy? And what's your aim? Is it metastatic disease? If it's metastatic disease and he's young, do you'd like to give him, I mean, as much as you can, good survival? I will use that. I mean, the most toxic combinations. That's going to increase his life survival to 11 months. If I'm seeing a borderline patient, he's not doing much of good. I will let him take the chemotherapy. So I would sit with the patient, explain to him what's the options. And uh, it's very important to understand what the patient wish. So let me ask you again, I will fire a question to you as a gastroenterologist. You have a 45 years old gentleman who has a 2.2 centimeters pancreatic mass and was referred from internist to uh, confirm the diagnosis. What do you think about this? What are you going to say to him? I'm part of the tumor board in the National Guard and I really learned a lot of things over the last few years since I got to And I'm trying to go streamline speech patients according to some guidelines we, we follow. I mean, if it is, the question is, is it resectable or not? It's resectable, 2.2 centimeters. So resectable, I would not touch it with a needle. I mean, although there's some reversing now, it is in the head or on the body, but if it is resectable, young man, and, and, and then I would just, you know, discuss with the tumor or get the consensus one, and then if he has a way and agreed upon to go to surgery right away. Yes. In the body, well, <coughs> this is something, again, where I... So you are completely right, and this is a very important message. So pancreatic cancer, if the patient is resectable or she is resectable, don't just touch the tumors. Go directly and send the patient for our colleague in surgery, and please don't go to take a biopsy. Leave the tumor there and send the patient for surgery. In patient with a resectable. <laughs> Presentation, but uh, if there is more and more enthusiasm toward new adjuvant treatment in even receptive disease, and that's just a matter of time to make selection for these two patients. <coughs> Again, there's a number of trials to, to, to answer this question, and it's not be a debate. You know, I, I believe, you know, if, if, if we are going to pick the patient with the best biology, the test of time with new adjuvant treatment is something we have to really to look into seriously. So for, for answering your question, if I'm planning new adjuvant, or if the patient has read about new adjuvant, or if he's on protocol, read the vibes with that yeah. and he's, you know, at stake, I think the body is, as, as, as you said, it is resectable to proceed to surgery, but for the body, I would do an uh, AUS, uh, not a uh, CT. Uh, yeah. I work hand in hand with this surgeon. I always ask him, even about the issue about spending. I mean, yes. These two areas, you know, Spending the bowel ducts, you know, they are structured. Or, I mean, it, it just all about the surgeon. Really, I'm again, you know, I think the European trend now to go on into new age, not even to a circle. I don't know about the American. Well, up, up front for surgery, yes. And even the trial of a new adjuvant was very conflicting. And we have a lot of meta analysis showed there is no point for the patient who is irresistible. The point only for borderline or locally advanced. Thank you, Mr. Sure. So our next guest speaker is Dr. John Molino. Uh, uh, you know, um, um, and uh, uh, to us today about promising to deliver drugs and update from s Uh, good morning again. I confess that when I saw the title of uh, 
the talk that you guys asked me to do, I, the first thing I did was smile and say, sure, yeah, promising a new can make clinical trials for pancreatic cancer. I don't think it's coming anytime soon. Um, uh, I want to thank Dr. Abdullah for the very good presentation that he had before. That actually, made my uh, my life much easier. Uh, the uh, in the United States, pancreatic cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer death, and um, as you can see, based on the numbers, there are 43,000 new cases and 40,000 of those die. So this is uh, depressing, and the median age of these patients is 72 years of age. Uh, what are the challenges in, uh, with our precision medicine initiative? One of the uh, tumors that we're looking in detail is pancreatic cancer. And uh, problems with pancreatic cancer is that quite often these patients are diagnosed very late. Uh, there is not a good screening test for pancreatic cancer. Patients do not respond to the therapy. They tend to be older. They tend to have poor performance status. And this is the most significant one for us. There is a lack of tissue for research. Uh, the most that these patients get is a fine needle biopsy. We need at least 500 cells for us to do molecular testing, and sometimes we don't get even 50 cells for these cases. Uh, for the cases that go to surgery, there's available tissue, but we believe that those patients probably have a different kind of disease. So like uh, any other tumors, what we're intending to do is to try to stratify pancreatic cancer into these different diseases. And the other big problem with um, pancreatic cancer is that the main mutations are not druggable, and I'm going to show you that. So these are the main mutations that are described for pancreatic cancer. There's one, two, three, and four tumor suppressor genes. As you know, we we'll do a good job at targeting oncogenes. These are the genes that if you have amplified or mutated, you have a gain of function. But for a tumor suppressor gene, that produces a loss of function, and we don't have a good way to target that one. And quite often for these genes, there is nothing downstream in the signal transduction pathway that we can target. A few patients do have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations as well as PALB2, but again, this is about 1% to 2% of the patients. So this was presented by Dr. Abdullah in this is the genomic analysis of pancreatic cancer. What we have here are the main genes that are involved. In blue, you'll see the genes that have mutations, and the two upper ones are KRAS and P53. Again, when you see those two mutations, it's frustrating because, as you know well, P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. KRAS is a GTP-bound tyrosine kinase, and the GTP stays bound to the uh, active catalytic domain, so there's no way. Um, a small molecular inhibitor, and then you have the other ones, uh, P16, that is the uh, CDK, N2, SMART4, and TGF beta. Uh, what you see in, uh, in green are losses in chromosomes, what you see in red are gains in the chromosomes. And that led to the uh, kind of definition of different subtypes of pancreatic cancer. are the patients that we have that sometimes do better than the other ones. And we also see the uh, kind of the genomic um, and then the inside, whatever you see, and this is a, an international uh, nomenclature for these things. If you see red, that means that there's amplification if you see green, that means that this deletion, the lines that go from one point to the other are usually intrachromosomal rearrangements. So you can see, if you see a lot of lines, that there is a lot of, you know, intrachromosomal rearrangement. If you see a lot of colors around, that indicates that there are a lot of gains and losses. And again, this is what is uh, we understand as the progression, the natural progression of uh, pancreatic cancer, where you start with a normal epithelium and then you, you keep on moving into cells that are more dysplastic to finally cells that are clearly, clearly anaplastic. The main signal transduction pathway have to do with a proliferation pathway as well as survival pathway. This too, but you also have the TJ beta SMART4 that is a pathway that communicates with cells around. And then we're now paying a lot of attention to the tumor microenvironment as being a determinant factor, and we're going to discuss later in one of the clinical trials how the um, the production of this hyaluronan 
and the extracellular factor seems to be a uh, um, determining point to explain why pancreatic cancer new uh, classification that has been postulated based on the expression. This is what you see, not at the gene level, but what you see at the protein level, and that defined the is four subtypes of pancreatic cancer. Uh, this is, again, more uh, from the point of view of looking at the cells, uh, at the protein. level. Percent, and uh, it's possible that some of these 3.9 percent are neuroendocrine tumors that were misclassified of other tumors that have more stable genome as opposed to the one, the one that we see more often with more unstable genome. <laughs> I'm going to give a brief introduction to metastatic adenocarcinoma, and then I'm going to focus in. So for the treatment of metastatic um, adenocarcinoma, and this was uh, uh, very nicely presented by Dr. Abdullah, we have gemcitabine, gemcitabine, pasorlotinib, fulfirinox, gemplasnap, paclitaxel. Data showing that gemcitabine plus 5-FU, um, when, I'm sorry, that gemcitabine when compared to 5-FU was superior. And something interesting with pa pancreatic cancer studies is if you look at how gemcitabine does, it's very consistent. You know, you always, pretty much always get the same number for all the clinical trials. Uh, this is when uh, gemcitabine uh, was combined with erlotinib, and there was a gain of a couple of weeks. over gemcitabine, uh, not only for the overall survival, but also for progression free survival. And uh, this is uh, this, the, um, the study of not paclitaxel um, uh, plus um, compared to um, plus gemcitabine compared to gemcitabine. I don't know if you know Dr. Van Holf. Um, I did some of my training in San Antonio, and he was the director of the uh, Clinical Research Center. But if you look, his name is associated with all of these clinical trials. Uh, he made a commitment years ago. He tells you always the story that he had a very, very good friend who died early on in life from pancreatic cancer. And he said, I'm going to defeat pancreatic cancer. Uh, Dr. Van Hall is approaching uh, 70 years of age, so I don't think he's going to have um, the privilege to do that. I wanted to focus a little bit in two uh, clinical trials because they are interesting. This is the Napoli study that Dr. Abdullah mentioned before. And uh, this study is interesting because this is going into this so-called smart way of delivering chemotherapy. Uh, to me, the smartest way is when you conjugate an antibody with a chemo load, like the DL3, DLL3 target that we're seeing now for the small cell lung cancer and some of the neuroendocrine tumors. But producing a nanoparticle like this using a liposome is also a very clever way because you can pack up to 80,000 irinotecan molecules per nanoparticle, and then that in kind of guarantees that you're going to have a higher concentration of the active drug in the tissue and that you're going to decrease some of the side effects. So this was the design of the study. Uh, the agent was given as a single agent or as, an, as the agent combined with 5-FU leucovorin, and this was also compared to 5-FU leucovorin. So a three-arm study, and uh, the results, as presented before, were positive in the sense that the combination of the um, uh, nanoparticle arenotecan plus 5-FU leucovorin was uh, superior to 5-FU uh, leucovorin that is seen on, on white. And uh, that superiority also extended to the progression-free survival. When you look at single agent, the uh, nanosphere um, irinotecan was as good as 5-FU leucovorin. So this opens the possibility that this also can be considered for the second line, although it's not approved for that indication. And now, this is one of the reports that we usually see. You guys are probably familiar that I think this is a report from Foundation Medicine. And when you send a sample that says pancreatic adenocarcinoma, uh, this is the usual report. And this is the same thing that I showed you before. So you have a mutation in KRAS 
This is the usual mutation, but you also have a mutation in P16. So this is a tumor suppressor gene, another tumor suppressor gene in SMAD4 that usually comes, and then a few other passenger uh, genes. And then the company kind of tells you, well, try trametinib. Oh, yes, that has been tried. And uh, you are familiar with the results of the trametinib study. Uh, there was uh, a study done combining trametinib plus gemcitabine, uh, trametinib being a MEK inhibitor, and then gemcitabine plus placebo. And um, uh, there was no significant difference in the performance of the two drugs. So that was the end of that story. So the current paradigm for advanced disease is, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned, you have these options for the patient who have good performance status, and you have these options for the patient who have less than good performance status. So what is what is in the horizon for pancreatic uh, novel cytotoxics? And I can scratch one of them. Uh, the, we did some studies with this hypoxia-activated drug, very clever design by the way. They have a, a compound that is activated under hypoxia, and it was linked to I'm sorry. I apologize for that. So that compound was linked to iphosphamide. Uh, and in the presence of hypoxia, the linker is destroyed. So that released the uh, active chemotherapy drug. Uh, the company did a lot of studies, not only in uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, but in lung cancer, and the studies were all negative. Uh, there are stromal depleting agents, and we're going to discuss uh, one of them, but at least uh, the, uh, this one, the studies did not go anywhere. There are signal transduction inhibitors that have been tested, and uh, probably the most promising results come from the PARP inhibitors for that subgroup of patients that have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Oh, Olapirib study, that's one of the PARP inhibitors that is produced by Abbott, and uh, this is a study that is open for pa patients that have BRCA mutations. cancers, and you see that pancreatic cancer produces some responses this year, and is a hyaluronic day. So, so this is a really simple concept. The, the product that is coding uh, some of our cells, as uh, Dr. Abdullah mentioned, this is part of the cartilage. And what happens when you have the position of these around the cells, uh, that increase the pressure and decrease the um, kind of the uh, immune cells to that uh, to that uh, cancer cell. So it's kind of protecting the cancer cell from the outside environment. And this is one of the reasons why pancreatic cancer is a hypoxic tumor. And the other reason is that because uh, this uh, hyaluronic acid actually compresses the vasculature and decreases the vascular access. So in theory, this is a very interesting target. Uh, um, a phase two study was uh, presented at ASCO this year, and uh, it was a combination of a hyaluronidase plus napaclitaxel gemcitabine versus napaclitaxel gemcitabine. These are the two arms of the study. Um, gemcitabine, um, the primary endpoint, and this is important, was progression-free survival, but the, we, uh, it was also known that this agent has a tendency to produce tr thromboembolic events. So it was looking at the uh, potential for thromboembolic events, and there were secondary and uh, exploratory endpoints. The study needed to be done in two stages. So, so in the first stage, it was more of a toxicity study. And the result of that the first analysis demonstrated that a significant proportion of the patients on the study were developing thromboembolic events. The study needed to be put on hold, and then the hold was released, was lifted, and the study proceeded to the second part once the patients were given low molecular weight heparin. So this is an agent that has to be given with, um, uh, deep, with um, prophylaxis. Uh, the um, the results of the uh, combination of stages one and two, when you look at progression 
Free Survival shows a little bit of superiority. You can see it here, uh, median progression of Free Survival of uh, six months compared to 5.3. Uh, when you look at the combined stages one and two for the, the tumor, the high, high levels of the, the hyaluronic acid, uh, the results become more uh, promising, meaning that you see a difference in progression-free survival from 5.2 to 9.2 months. And then the secondary endpoint was overall response rate. And uh, uh, please be aware that blue is uh, the hyaluronidase plus chemo and uh, yellow is chemo. So you had a lot of patients actually giving some sort of response in these waterfall uh, plots, but um, the overall response rate was uh, superior for the group of patients that have the experimental agent compared to uh, the chemotherapy arm. Um, there were exploratory endpoints looking at overall survival for uh, patients who have high level of hyaluronic acid, and they also demonstrated a borderline superiority uh, side effects from these agents are actually not that uh, notorious. Uh, it produces some muscle cramps. The patients complain about having muscle spasms. And remember, this uh, has a tendency to produce uh, venous thrombosis, so it has to be done given with uh, low molecular weight heparin. But overall, they are very similar to the side effects that you get from the chemotherapy. Um, when you look at the exploratory overall survival, the progression-free survival and overall survival uh, for the patients who have high levels, the results were positive, uh, indicating that there's probably some uh, promising, uh, that this agent is probably promising for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And this table shows the, the results in numbers, so they are much easier to appreciate. Uh, this is the uh, experimental arm of the hyaluronidase plus napaclitaxel when you look at progression-free survival versus the uh, chemotherapy. Uh, so that was uh, considered to be promising. Uh, there is an ongoing phase three study, and the design is very similar, and these patients need to be, on again, on low molecular weight heparin. Now, this is the bad news. Uh, this is SWOG uh, um, 1313. This was a phase one slash two of the PEG to add it to fulfilling for metastatic pancreatic cancer. Again, the, the chemotherapy backbone, where this one has fulfilling and the other one had napaclitaxel, but pretty much given in the same way. And um, I believe this is early April. It's actually here, late March. The study was closed uh, because it fell to uh, um, reach the um, futility analysis that was planned. Uh, the study has not opened since that time, but there are a lot of ongoing trials. So this is pancreatic cancer. You see this graph, it looks confusing because pancreatic cancer is confusing. It's not only that it has genes that are difficult to target, but it's also that the tumor microenvironment plays a significant role. It's also that there are multiple signal transduction pathways that are involved, making it difficult for uh, the, this tumor to be um, to be treated. Now, this is the Tokyo subway map. I was in Tokyo about three weeks ago, and it's really scary because, you know, the train comes, and you have to make your decision, should I take it or not? And then the train leaves, and you regret not uh, taking the train. But uh, when you see this, you see some of our tumors that we have to deal. I think this is not for us, the molecular biologists. I think this is for engineers, for system engineers, to figure out where the roads cross. So we can use targets that are actually uh, blocking the interaction of those multiple signal transduction pathways that are abnormal for pancreatic cancer. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great honor and a pleasure to be with you again here in, in Riyadh. And it's uh, thanks for the invitation, Ashwaq, Dr. Jazeel, Shoki, everybody's here. 
So uh, let's see if we have any uh, updates uh, for pancreatic cancer from a surgeon perspective. And uh, I'm sure you guys, you know, we, we, this, is, this is the uh, uh, platform of my talk. We're going to see if what we have done to optimize treatment for resectable pancreatic cancer. And then uh, touch a little bit on laparoscopic pancreatic surgery. And then see what we have done to optimize uh, borderline and locally advanced and see if there is any role for surgery for metastatic disease in a palliative intent. Okay, as you all know, it's a, a fourth leading cause of cancer-related death, and it's becoming the third. And in 2030, it's actually it's going to be after lung cancer in terms of cancer-related death. So uh, as you know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of affect the head, body, and tail. My talk would be really mainly on the uh, pancreatic head tumors, since it's really uh, almost 70% uh, of the tumors are in the head, and that's where most of the challenge that we face. So we all agree pancreatic cancer is a bad disease. And this is a very nice uh, uh, article from the population-based uh, uh, database from England and Wales over 40 years, uh, let's say at all cancer survivals. If you look at colon cancer, we were able to triple or double the survivals at uh, one year, five year, and at 10 years. Unfortunately, the situation for pancreatic cancer, we were successful to double the survival over 40 years for one year. And I think it's mainly due to us as a surgeons, I would believe so, because we took it out. But if you look at the five year and 10 year survival, it's the same over 40 years. So it's really so frustrating and depressing to deal with these facts, but you know, these are the facts. And I think the role is open for really more and more trials and more investigations with this disease. So these are the challenges. We have poor survival with all stages. Majority of patients, they have what we call locally advanced or metastatic disease at the, at the presentation. Even those who underwent resections, we really feel proud of ourselves. Majority up to 80% recur, uh, and that's because of the micrometastatic disease. And then when the symptoms happen, it's really bad symptoms and depletating in terms of pain, jaundice, asphyxia, as well as nausea and vomiting. This is my favorite uh, quote in uh, oncology ever, you know. This is Dr. Uh, Black Katie, he's a surgical oncologist from Brown, and he, 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 you guys all know this, but I, I always keep, keep, keep bringing this in all my presentations because I think it's all about biology eventually, and then selection comes next, and then technical maneuvers, radiation, surgery, RFAs, chemotherapy, everything comes as technical maneuvers, which really, really helps just a little bit, and eventually biology would, would rules out and governs the outcomes. So let's see what we have done in terms of, no, understanding biology is the key. And, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Molina had said way to, with pancreatic cancer, but let's see what we have done with technical maneuvers and selection. So it's a spectrum of disease. As you can see, we have the resectable with the best optimal treatment. We were talking about 28, min, 28 month survival. Then we have the other extreme, which is the metastatic with the best outcome six to 12 months with the best optimal treatment. And in between, we have the borderline and locally advanced. So in, in resectable cancer, I think, you know, the issue of assessing resectability by taking a patient to the OR, it's over. And I think you have really to have a well done uh, CT scan called pancreas protocol CT scan in order to assess resectability. And other than the uh, peritoneal, small peritoneal myths or uh, uh, small liver myths that cannot be detected on CT scan, I think you can tell based on a well-done CT scan, whether this is a resectable, and then we'll, we'll touch the issue of borderline and locally advanced later on. So this, this disease, again, the resectability, mainly in relation to the SMV portal vein and the superior mesenteric artery, you can see there's a clear fat plane among these two vessels. So this is a resectable disease, and nobody on earth would argue with this. So this patient gets a standard Whipple operation. From a historical perspective, uh, uh, Alan Whipple, he reported in the Annals of Surgery back in 1935 uh, on three patients. One survived 30 hours, one survived eight months, and one survived 25 months. I can tell you for almost now 80 years, we still do the same surgery or the same uh, for this pancreatic disease. We get better at, at, uh, at a lot of things. If you can see, this is a 30-year uh, trend in outcomes of uh, pancreatic cancer surgery in Sloan Kettering. We really got better at 30-day mortality and 90-day mortality, but the main impact was at one year 
uh, outcomes. And I think the main thing is we were really able to do the surgery safer. And when complications happen, we were able to rescue the patient. And I think this is very essential. Most of the, you know, the issues is able to, to rescue the patients when complications happen. We have better imaging modalities. We have interventional gastroenterologists, interventional radiologists that really help us big time with, with complications. So legends like Dr. Cameron, who just published 2,000 Whipple surgery recently, Mary Brennan from Sloan Kettering, they really were able to, to make the mortality down to 1% to 2% from up to 40% in the past. We still have high morbidities, but most of these morbidities or complications, you know, that as you have a grading for side effects for chemotherapy, we have a grading. Dendo uh, classification, no uh, uh, major uh, uh, interventions in terms, again, and the mortality is only 1% to 2%. So we were able to do the surgery safe, and we have reduced the mortality. Can we do more? And this is, comes here, the laparoscopic surgery, uh, the minimally invasive surgery for pancreatic cancer, trying to minimize the impact of surgical trauma in order to improve the quality of life. And, you know, there is a pros and cons for laparoscopic surgery in pancreatic cancer. Again, decreased blood loss, fewer wound complication, faster recovery. And then the cons, which is comes at the, are we really doing the same oncological procedure laparoscopically or not? It comes with the technical difficulties and a higher cost. But the issue is here is that what we as laparoscopic surgeons believe that if we do the surgery with less impact, the patient can go quicker to something called return to intended oncological therapy or RIOT. And this term is now more and more used in, in minimally invasive uh, oncological surgery that this patient can start chemotherapy earlier. And basically, this, is, this is, has been proven, for example, in colon cancer, laparoscopic colorectal surgery might have a survival benefit over open, mainly in stage three, where I think when you get patient back to chemotherapy faster, then this basically can improve his survival because, again, it's a multimodal treatment. So this is the state-of-the-art conference from AHBBA last year. So they discussed this issue extensively, and you can see the number of publications had increased over the years. Again, still limited number, 150 publications per year, but again, there are more and more uh, adaptation for this procedures, especially for the distal pancreatic tumors. which is the best we have from single series. We don't have any uh, uh, prospective randomized trials. And then Professor Michael Kendrick, uh, uh, he's now the pioneer of laparoscopic pancreatic odidinectomy from Mayo Clinic. And actually, he, the one who revived it after uh, a guy called Michel Gagné had declined in 1994 that Whipple should not be done laparoscopic. Dr. Kendrick <laughs> did not believe that. And so he had now more than, I think, 300 uh, laparoscopic Whipples, including vein resections. That's done laparoscopically. So just to summarize, minimally invasive distal pancreatectomy, and this is minimally invasive pancreatic odidinectomy. So in terms of perioperative outcomes compared to open, operative time for the distal is similar, blood loss is lower, complications is fewer, and the hospital stay is shorter. So again, perioperative outcome for the distal panc spleen is much better in laparoscopic compared to open. Again, this is again highly, highly selected patients in a high high uh, volume centers with high skilled surgeons. In terms of Whipple surgery, as you can see here, operative time is longer, uh, blood loss is lower, complications is similar, and length of stay is similar. So there's a lot of questions about the utility of do doing laparoscopic Whipples. Again, you know, some people are still sticking to doing it, but again, the evidence is not that great. Thanks, spleen. We have similar margin, similar to more lymph nodes, Similar uh, time to chemo, which is again the riot intended return to intended oncological treatment. Similar, and then the survival is similar. For the minimally invasive pancreatic odontectomy with better visualization, we have even more lymph nodes reported. Again, these are highly selected patients in high volume centers with high specialization. So again, we still have some time to adopt these procedures more and more. And and this is the European. Uh, 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 the grade three uh, complication, Kelvin and Dindo, and the 90 day mortality were comparable. So, again, for distal laparoscopic.
it uh, 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 without any compromise of the oncological outcomes. Now, so, you know, I still remember my first Whipple surgery. I really felt so proud. And basically, uh, it really gives you so much adrenaline in your body after doing the laparoscopic Whipple surgery with, with, again, low mortality, relatively acceptable morbidity. And the question is what, what the patient outcomes eventually. And you will be surprised that most of these patients recur. These are the adjuvant trials. Again, uh, Dr. Abdullah had talked about it. But majority of them, 80% will have recurrence. And then the five-year survival with the best, with the best outcomes, again, the SPAC4 is 28%. Now, with the exceptions of the S1 uh, uh, data from Japan, which again, 44% five-year survival. And I, I have a question for you, the oncologist, why we're not really adopting this, this data. I know there is a genetic uh, problems with the, the drug metabolism, but the data for S1 for pancreas and stomach in Japan is very uh, compelling that maybe this is the way to go. Anyway, this is a question for you. So the guidelines now for resectable disease is to proceed with surgery. Uh, sorry, level uh, type 1 recommendation or strong recommendation level 1 evidence. In terms of new adjuvant treatment, again, we can go on back and forth with all these trials that's going on for resectable disease. This is the ongoing trial, the uh, new adjuvant uh, plus adjuvant versus adjuvant only with resectable disease. It's, it's still ongoing. And the other thing, uh, uh, NAP paclitaxel versus uh, wood gems versus fulfuronox, again, as a, as a new adjuvant treatment with patients. Again, this is for resectable disease. Uh, very good point Dr. Abdullah had made about the margin positivity in the SPAC uh, for where patients with positive margin did not really benefit uh, from the adjuvant chemotherapy. And this, the margin issue comes into play here that really a positive margin is a bad, bad outcome. If you look at all the data that publish on positive margin, really have a bad biology. And what we can do to help with positive margin from our, our standpoint as a surgeon. And again, most positive margins nowadays really happens in patients with borderline and locally advanced, not in patients with resectable, because now it's a standard of care to do something called the periadventitial uh, dissection of the superior mesenteric the superior mesenteric artery to make sure you're taking everything out in a patient with a resectable disease. So we'll talk about the borderline resectable and, and the locally advanced disease. And we had really a lot of problems as a surgeons uh, with this with these definitions. And, and basically what we have done over the years, we were able to now reach some sort of a consensus on the And then we'll talk a little bit on new adjuvant, uh, talk about local therapy and then radiation that's been utilized by surgeons uh, for this disease. So the question is, here, is this borderline receptor or locally advanced? You see the tumor has some sort of uh, touching the portal vein with less than 80 degrees. There's really a lot of issues, especially with all these trials that were published, that they included this, this for example, as a resectable disease in some trials. How about this disease? See, the vein is, is we have some sort of, uh, uh, maybe a plane uh, between the tumor and the vein, but the tumor is now in case you have some sort of abutment of the SMA around like in 180 degrees. Is this resectable or unresectable? Or it's borderline resectable? Same is here. Tumor is encasing SMA, but it's patent and also encasing. So SMV and this is encasing. So eventually, after all the work that were done over the last years, we had some, some consensus. But again, we still have an AHBBA guidelines. We have the NCCN guidelines and we have the intergroup alliance definitions of resectability. Minor changes but again, it makes really a difference when, when in, in trials, when you're comparing patients head to head, you have really to have a clear definitions. What is borderline resectable? What's locally advanced? And what is our, 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 our one resection? Is it, is it one millimeter negative margin? Is it presence of tumor cells? And that I think the alliance for the research protocols, they had reached into agreement about the definitions. Doug Evans from uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, who were at MD Anderson before, he even brought more uh, 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 conf confusion to the issue. 
for locally advanced, now he's categorizing them as type A or type B for the possible conversion to resectability. So again, you really need to have to work with a good pancreatic surgeon to realize all these minor details in terms of what is re reconstructable, what is resectable, what is convertible to resection. Okay. So, uh, and for the NCCN guidelines, now we have a standardized report that you have to go through all these details. I think uh, this is very important, our careful radiological evaluation, for example, less than 100, check, 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 check. All these things are very important to eventually realize whether this is resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced. Again, I'm not, still we're talking about surgical intervention. We're not talking about multimodal therapy. So let's see our, we are surgeons you know, show us a vein resection, we can do it. It's easy, by the way, it's not that difficult. A surgeon with, a, with some vascular experience can do a lot of, you know, vascular reconstruction. But is this the, 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 good, the, the right thing to do for these patients, especially knowing that they have a bad biological disease? In terms of vein resections, we have three systematic reviews. Uh, all of them uh, 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 were showed a mortality and morbidity relatively similar, slightly higher. Uh, compared to a standard rubble operation, but again, you're dealing with a bad disease to start with. In terms of R0 resection, almost, you know, uh, uh, up to one third to 40% of this patient had positive uh, margin. Again, and a survival that is slightly better than metastatic disease, but again, less than uh, optimal treatment when they get uh, uh, standard rubble for resectable disease with adjuvant treatment. And the, and the consensus amongst <coughs> hepatopancreatic biliary surgeon that Vein restriction should be offered for these patients, especially now after new adjuvant treatment. Again, we'll touch on the new adjuvant just in a little bit. Again, a, a study uh, just was published recently. Uh, these, uh, these patients took, were taken to the operating room directly, did not get any new adjuvant treatment. And you can see the survival is similar for those who get uh, vein restriction versus for those who did not. But it's much better than those, this is the green, it's not showing, for those who just had a bypass, no resection. So again, vein restriction offer, offer a, 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 a survival advantage over patients who did not get restrictions and only bypass. Again, higher mortality, higher morbidity, similar uh, overall survival, longer operative time, and blood loss. We now have techniques that are standard for vein restrictions with all these types and modifications. And uh, you, you really, when you do a vein restriction or planning to do a vein restriction, you have to do something called the SMA first approach. You have to clear the superior mesenteric artery first before you do the vein restriction. So can we push the envelope further? How about arterial resection? And if you look at this meta-analysis from very highly specialized uh, uh, retrospective with a very high selection bias, that arterial resection, talking about mainly superior mesenteric artery, had higher mortality and had poor survival. And most, most pancreatic surgeons will not do it unless there were really very, very high selection of these patients with good performance, good response to the adjuvant treatment and stable disease, then we, we might try an, uh, uh, some sort of arterial resection. So can we do better at selection? The question comes really the test of time and the test of biology using new adjuvant treatment. And here comes the multi multidisciplinary treatment in order to select the patient with really who would benefit from all these aggressive interventions and aggressive surgery. Again, there is a lot of benefits, you know, at least presumed benefits from a new adjuvant treatment. They might increase the resectability. Some surgeons are skeptical about that because you will really know if this patient is resectable, borderline, or locally advanced from the get going, and you will have to plan your surgery from the first encounter with the patient. So it might help in accentuating the margin or increasing the margin negative resection, but for resectability, converting an unresectable or locally advanced to resectable with, with, with the data that we have, we still, uh, uh, as a surgeons, have skeptical about that. And then treating, uh, targeting occult metastatic disease and early intervention, because we know only 30 to 40 percent of patients eventually finish the adjuvant treatment. Not all of them finish adjuvant treatment or make it to adjuvant treatment because of the post-operative complication as well as the post uh, the, uh, the morbidity. And then I think the unique window of really selecting the patient who would really benefit from surgery and, uh, and, and, and excluding the patient who would really progress on new adjuvant chemo radiation therapy. And the enthusiasm of, of new adjuvant treatment is becoming now even with resectable disease. And it's mainly thank you for these two effective regimens, the fulfurinox and gemnapaclitaxel. Before these two regimens, we really were so skeptical about new adjuvant treatment because we know 
in the best adjuvant setting, these things are not working. So now basically with the metastatic setting, we have good response rate here. More and more we're utilizing fulfurinox as, as a treatment for new adjuvant treatment, despite the lack of evidence and the lack of strong data to support that. This is the population-based study with the uptake of fulfurinox in, in Ontario, Canada. And you can see there's an increase since the publication in the JAMA 2011. There's a significant increase in the use of fulfurinox for all stages of pancreatic cancer, not, not necessarily the metastatic. These are the meta-analyses in patients with resectable disease. Again, small numbers, retrospective, uh, definitions of R1, the definition of borderline, definition of metastatic disease. So locally advanced, it was not clear among all these uh, meta-analyses with some benefits in, in, in patients with borderline resectable and a lot of questionable benefits in patients with resectable disease. So actually, the, 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 the issue of new adjuvant therapy in pancreatic cancer bring more questions than answers. Which regimen, how much, or how long radiation, for how much, for how long, with, without, with SPRT, then the use of fiducials, uh, that's another thing. So all these questions, again, they are under ongoing trials. And I think this is a very nice trial that was published recently from Matthew Katz, who's a surgeon, Syed Ahmed is a surgeon, Andrew Louis was a surgeon, that uh, the uh, Alliance uh, 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 trial, I think this is a phase two trial, Olferonox with radiation resulted in into a, a, a relatively a very high uh, margin negative, 93%, uh, and then as high as 13% uh, with complete pathological response. Something just to keep in mind in terms of uh, radiological response, majority of these patients uh, uh, had a stable disease. So again, you don't really want, you don't, you don't, you're not looking for a radiological response to take the patient to the operating room. You just, you know, and again, this is the MD Anderson, uh, MD Anderson data. Only uh, a, a few of these patients had response on CT scan, 84% had no response. And this is an example of a, a case that we still have encasement of the hepatic artery right there. But when you took the patient to surgery after knee adjuvant uh, chemo radiation, it was T0 and 0 R0. The other thing is that R1 patients after knee adjuvant treatment does better, we, you know, and it's as comparable as to uh, a survival that is 21 months, even with R1 restriction after knee adjuvant treatment. So there's a lot of argument and, and, and enthusiasm about moving to knee adjuvant treatment, even with resectable disease. These are the NCC, NCCN guidelines for locally advanced and borderline resectable, where, again, these are the regimens that's recommended. This is the alliance, uh, uh, another alliance ongoing trials, Fulfurinox, Fulfurinox chemo radiation, uh, Fulfurinox SBRT uh, followed by surgery. Again, there are so many questions, and we'll hopefully all these trials will eventually answer it. Uh, this is a French trial, uh, Fulfurinox uh, uh, chemo radiation versus Fulfurinox followed uh, by surgery. Uh, so these are the, there's a lot of ongoing trials for new adjuvant treatment. Hopefully, we will find uh, a way. My approach is to start with fulfurinox only, and based on uh, the performance and the response to the patient, take him to surgery. Uh, and the other new thing that we're talking about is called irreversible electroporation. And uh, this is uh, Bob Martin from Louisville has been really uh, talking about this for almost now uh, seven years. And uh, electroporation is trying to increase the electrical conductivity and permeability of the cell plasma membrane induced by external electrical fields. So what you do is actually try to do induce cell damage by damaging the cell membrane and making it more susceptible to systemic immunotherapy. So somehow this electroporation had the effect maybe of the immune therapy for a local disease. It's different than RFA or thermal ablation. There are two main, two main use for this uh, electroporation. One is trying to uh, use it in situ for patients with unresectable disease, just do the electroporation, trying to kill the cells while it's in situ. And then 20% of the cases has been to try to accentuate the margin and getting a margin negative resection rate uh, after resection. So this is the tumor that is uh, encasing the portal vein and superior mesenteric artery. With these uh, needles, you try to induce a perfectly selected uh, uh, voltage of current among these needles, try to induce this uh, uh, cell membrane damage without affecting the uh, SMV and the SMA. And again, they really had tough time early on with a survival as low as six months, uh, six months, uh, six months. But now actually, uh, as they passed the learning curve and we have more, more uh, 
specification of the techniques, they're now reaching a, a survival that is actually comparable uh, 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 much higher than the standard chemotherapy for these patients. So these are the survival that's reported for uh, 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 chemotherapy, which is the best care, compared to these are the survivals for the IRE either in situ or uh, after restriction. The question is, can we push the envelope further by selecting these patients? Again, I'm just going to throw this for for very selected group of patients who you gave them the adjuvant treatment with a single metastatic liver disease, and they have a stable disease, and they have excellent performance status. Would you offer them surgery for the resectable for the metastatic disease as well as uh, the uh, local disease? This is the group of Heidelberg uh, Butchler. You all uh, have heard about him. So he he had maybe published the largest number of patients with uh, resecting M1 disease in a highly selected group of patients. Again, these patients were given new adjuvant treatment. They have a stable disease. They have excellent performance. Is it really worth to subject them to? to uh, this uh, major surgery, the Whipple, as well as the metastatectomy. And you can see uh, these are the patient characteristics. These are the liver resection that they've done, as well as the enter uh, aortocaval lymph node resection. If you see the survival, an actual uh, five-year survival, about 8% in, in, in this group of patients, which is, I think, a very impressive uh, group of patients. Uh, this is meta-analysis that actually was just founded yesterday, December 2017. Meta-analysis of all the trials, majority again from Germany, uh, some from United States, Italy, China, and Europe. And you can see the mortality and morbidity, again, small number of patients, highly selective group, the mortality and morbidity the same, but the three, one year and three year survival are much better uh, uh, with, the, with the metastatectomy group compared to the open, to non-metastatectomy or the patient were treated with best supportive care. So I think, I think we have to do better at selections. We've done our best with clinical selection, performance status, uh, radiological selection, but we have to do more work on molecular uh, and, 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 and therapeutic selective selection based on uh, molecular-driven therapy. As Dr. Uh, Molina had said, again, it is a very heterogeneous uh, group of patients with a lot of non-targetable mutations. Again, these are the pathways that Dr. Molina had talked about. And, but I think this is a very interesting that was came out in nature that now we know that BRCA mutational signatures burden correlates with the response to platinum-based PARP inhibitors. Again, needs more and more validations, but I think at the end of the day, it's all about biology. Thank you. Uh, so the question about locally advanced with obstructive jaundice, or let's say a clinical obstruction. I think that with the development in ERCPs and, and stents, as well as, you know, I think this is the best, the, the, the first and the most, I think, effective way to drain the patients with a true locally advanced disease. Now, if they could not do it, uh, I think you can now try the percutaneous uh, intervention radiologist, percutaneous uh, stenting. And if they cannot do it, then we do for surgical bypass. But I think... With the advancement in uh, in ERCPs and uh, interventional geologists, most of these patients will be drained uh, without major surgery. Uh, and it, uh, so, do I understand correctly from you that patients who uh, you designate as they are unresectable, whatever we do, you don't think they will be converted to resectable? The locally advanced type B, there's no. So there's two types of locally advanced right now. Locally advanced type A, I think they're potentially resectable with arterial resection. Okay. And locally advanced type B, they're not going to be resectable at all. So we should not actually 
If he tells you, 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 you just ask your surgeons, do you think you can take it out even after I give him chemotherapy? And it depends on his training and aggressiveness and a lot of things, but in his comfort zone, like, this is very important. Again, a patient with, you have subjected him to the test of time. You gave him new adjuvant treatment. Let's say new adjuvant full fronox, and then you added even radiation therapy, and he still have the same disease. Did not show any metastasis. These are the patients that you have to go back to your surgeon, tell him, how about arterial resection? How about like what, what you can do for this patient? Because I think these are the one who's delineating their biology to be the best biology over the test of time with what you're doing. But I think it's a back, it's not necessarily a back and forth. It is again bringing this because again the aim is a cure and the aim is the patient. It's not the surgeon ego or the oncologist, you know, pushing the surgeon. And there's that almost comfort zone for every surgeon. If you tell I can't do it, send it to somewhere else. You know, I think he should be honest with you. I've seen, I've sent some arterial resection in the United States to Doug Evans, and they've done very well. You know, SMA, celiac resection, we, he can reconstruct anything in this selected group of patients. Well, thank you. This is the volunteer. And then. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be with you today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ojazi and Dr. Rashwag. And I've been wondering, like, uh, Abdullah, why Ashwag chose this topic for me? This we'll have discussion later on, inshallah. So uh, this topic is very controversial. This is the highest controversial topic in the GI oncology. is uh, is is not easy at all. So this is outline of my topic. I'm going to talk about the role of radiotherapy in uh, the different category categories of uh, pancreatic cancer. Then we're going to go through why that's happening, all this conflicting data, and the new directions, which is the SPRT. In the resectable uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, here is the respective, uh, uh, respectable uh, guideline, the NCC guideline, followed by many physicians all over the world. And uh, here it's mentioned that uh, one of the options can be induction chemotherapy, followed by chemoradiotherapy in the adjuvant setting. If we look in the contrary on the European guideline, they will not mention it unless you're doing clinical trial. So radiotherapy is not an option for adjuvant uh, in the adjuvant setting. This is, uh, I think slide been uh, shown before. This is uh, historical data about radiotherapy. It started here from the United States, positive trial, tried to replicate it by the URTC negative then SPEC-1 actually showed the radiation is harmful in those cases. Then the RTOG, which is like kind of Madonna, but unfortunately the question wasn't radiotherapy, no radiotherapy, it was chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and another type of chemotherapy, radiotherapy. The, the three trials which we base like maybe the decision on it, they, they, are, they do not represent nowadays at all. The radiation technique used is 40 gray split course. No one in earth will use this anymore. I, I, like we cannot imagine in our generation somebody will use this kind of radiation. It is not effective. Not The dose is not effective. Splitting the dose is harmful in radiotherapy. So the rationale at, the, at, the, uh, at those days was because they're using the x-ray actually to identify where is the tumor. So they, they open like big field in the abdomen just to cover the pancreas. So that was the only way to do this trial. Uh, second thing is uh, there was no quality assurance in radiotherapy, and this is very important to step for, uh, for radiotherapy. There is also some trial flaws, like in the AORTC, there is pre uh, tumor included in the trial, a lot of positive margin, and all of those gonna uh, affect the survival at the end. 
SP1, it is a highly controversial one, multifactorial. You can choose your arm for randomizations, no quality assurance. So it is all uh, full with the points that we cannot pass it, I mean, to get results from it actually. If we go, I mean, for the high center dealing with the high volume center dealing with pancreatic cancer, John Hopkins, my clinic, they combine their analysis in more than 900 patients, and they show, I mean, there is a survival benefit with chemo rad uh, versus nothing. And if you do more like match pair analysis, the survival <laughs> if in actually show uh, like a bigger difference uh, on that. The future is here in the RTOG0848 trial. This is uh, currently accrual. The target is more than 900 patients. It is two questions, gem eratinib that closed after the lab 07 trial. Uh, the second question is radiation or no radiation. So then we, they modify on the trial. Now you can use other than gem cytopene, any kind of the new chemotherapy. And also you can start radio chemotherapy before the registration. This is still open to accrual. This is a good study, good quality. So I think that will seal it forever. If this negative, then the adjuvant rule for radiotherapy and pancreatic cancer will not be there anymore. So we'll wait for this for, for this trial. So now, like as a radiation oncologist, uh, still controversial. I do recommend for some patient with positive margin, lymph node to lesser extent, like not the lymph node to me, it is not a big uh, uh, factor to give adjuvant radiation. The new factor now is also to stratify the patient based on the CA19.9 and also in the future, maybe there is some molecular stuff can guide that. Any way, if you're going to do the radiations, we'll give the chemotherapy first. That's the point. This will give the chemotherapy at, at least for cycle or the whole, I mean, uh, uh, regimen, and then we'll add the radiation at the end. In the borderline, again, here the NCCA gui NCCN guideline. So uh, it mentioned for the adjuvant, you can give chemotherapy, you can give chemo radiotherapy. There wasn't any uh, recommendation to this or that. So as you know, the rationale from new adjuvant, especially in this kind of cancer, R1 is very, very harmful and it is independent factor for survival and local recurrence. So we need to get R0, new adjuvant will help in that. Micrometasis, which we know that disease, if they have micrometasis until proven otherwise. Uh, for us, also it is easier in the radiation therapy delivery. We can test our, I mean, drugs for the sensitivity. And also we can allow the biology to declare itself. Uh, as Dr. Hamid mentioned, like he's going to spend on the OR many hours and uh, doing a lot of good stuff. And then after a few months, the patient have metastasis. If we select our patient by doing that, that will help both uh, our patient and the physician as well. Also, uh, we know this can work in allergy eye malignancy. We do it in rectum, we do it in gastric, we do it in esophagus, in all cancers. This can work and it's usually give very good result. Borderline uh, data uh, is no randomized. Most of them is prospective phase one, phase two, uh, multiple, I mean, retrospective. This, all of them, they are all, uh, as you see, uh, multiple chemo uh, regimen, radiation, also multiple radiation regimen. We have uh, complete resections in up to 70%. And we have like good survival. All those are old. The new one, like I can, I'm gonna allude to what Dr. Hamid mentioned, the Alliance trial. This is a United States trial. It was actually a feasibility to do a, like a study in multiple center in, in the state. So it is multiple 14 center uh, on the state, single arm prospective, 22 patient modify for Pharonox, then they go for radiotherapy 50 in uh, 28, modern radiotherapy as well. And we have here up to 70% they went for surgery and the complete margin 93. And we have 30, 33%, they have less than 5% viable tumor. And uh, actually also 13% have pathological complete response. And if you look to those who have like less than 5% 
fibal tumor uh, compared to the one more than five, there is actually a survival benefit between the two. So that's like a, an excellent trial in the modern era and show us like the chemotherapy with the radiotherapy can uh, actually help those patients in the borderline. In the locally advanced, again, the NCC guideline, here we have either uh, the option of induction chemo followed by radiation, chemo rad or SPRT, or we have in selected patients to start with chemo rad or SPRT. So uh, uh, this, uh, uh, so in this category, I'm, I'm just gonna, I mean, mention that, that that study would change my mind about like how I think about uh, pancreatic cancer. We think all patients dying from metastasis until proven otherwise. In this autopsy study, it showed two patterns of death. There is like the majority, as we know, 70% metastatic, but there is 30% of patients will die from only pancreatic disease locally. No mets and all, or maybe there is few oligometastasis. So the major like cause of death is locally. And then they correlated with some molecular stuff and uh, that's related to the DBC4 uh, gene, uh, and that's what they conclude from that study. Again, here, a, a large one from Korea, more than 600 patients. They did molecular stuff for them, and we see the same thing. The DBC4 positive here, we have more local, local regional recurrence disease than uh, metastasis in the opposite to the negative one. And if we look at that group, this is like subgroup analysis and all of that, but here is like very interesting thing, like if for this group with high local regional recurrence, if you give them local treatment, so on, uh, so I mean RFA, radiotherapy, any form, you're going to get a big difference in median survival from 44 months to uh, 20 months, and that's statistically significant. Uh, and in the negative one, there is no significant, I mean, difference between the survival. Again, history, we have the FIC or like F, uh, F, FCD trial from uh, Europe in France, and we have the ECOC from 4201 uh, from the state. Conflicting data again, here is negative harmful, here is positive, and uh, get a benefit of a couple of months in survival. Uh, so uh, if, if you can see from here, the, the, the European one, very high dose of uh, radiotherapy, and most of those patients can uh, could not get the maintenance chemotherapy because they were sick after radiotherapy. And we think that's the reason for this trial. This was moderate. However, there was, even with this trial, the, the great rate toxicity, and for it is 40%. So it is also very high, but still we, we maintain, I mean, survival benefit. Then we have the recent... Uh, European trial, the LAB07 trial. It is randomization between GEM and Eratinib as one question. And if you don't progress, then you go to the second randomization between radiotherapy and no radiotherapy. And still the European, I mean, like intentionally, they, they want to sabotage radiotherapy. That's, I think, their main goal. Again, negative trial. But if you look into the trial in details, first, the protocol issue, like protocol of radiotherapy, only third of the patient followed the protocol. The majority of them did not follow the protocol. And this is very important. Look at this graph. This is a survival graph. And this is not uh, one of the drug codes, million or anything. This is actually the RTOG 97004 trial, one of the adjuvant trial. And they compare just the radiotherapy if you follow the protocol and if you do not follow the protocol and see how big is the survival difference between the two. And any radiation oncologist know that this is the pancreas is very complicated area to define, to define the organ around it, the risk, the delivery. It is its need a quality assurance. So if the if here the the quality assurance is not good, so I, I'm I'm questioning the validity of the, I mean, radiation questions. Uh, second thing, uh, only 61 of the population, like from the first randomization, went to the second randomization. So that would have affect, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the significance 
of the survival and also mean maybe the chemotherapy, I mean, or the population more very high risk and we couldn't control the disease. Just 40, like 60% only had, I mean, control disease with the chemotherapy. But uh, we still have, I mean, positive results. If you look at the delay of the reintroducing of the treatments uh, between radiotherapy, no radiotherapy, six months versus 3.7 months. And to me, this is a positive one. We are dealing with locally advanced, non-curable disease. Quality of life is very important. If we give them a break of six months from chemotherapy, I think this is important for the patient. Uh, also, local regional progressions, there was better control with adding radiotherapy uh, to, uh, to the chemotherapy. So, I mean, with all this conflicting data, why we have this result? Some are positive, some are negative. Uh, um, hypothetically, like I'm, I'm thinking about what's what's causing that. First, it, it might radiation not work. It might this is not one of the diseases that radiation can add a benefit, which I don't think so the case because of many trials from high volume center showing uh, a benefit, and it is like actually a standard a gu standard guideline in many of of those high center uh, high volume center. Maybe the things is the selections, which I think that's very positive. I mean, it is heterogeneous group. Some of the group, as we showed by the molecular stuff, they have over it like metastasis disease. So whatever local control I'm going to achieve by radiotherapy is not going to improve the survival. It, the chemotherapy will not, I mean, control all that metastasis. So we need to select which patient is going to benefit actually from radiotherapy. I don't think so. All the patients will benefit from radiotherapy. Uh, third point is something from like a technical thing from us. The, I mean, targeting the pancreatic cancer is not easy. It's not like rectal cancer or other cancer. It's very uh, difficult uh, area to contour, difficult small uh, organs, sensitive organ around it. So it needs like modern uh, imaging. And nowadays, that's what we use. Like during planning radiotherapy, we use triphasic CT, like the diagnostic. We use MRI and we use beta scan to identify where is the tumor exactly. And that wasn't done in any of those trials I showed you before. Also, from the delivering of radiotherapy, this is how the delivery of radiotherapy on the uh, SPEC1 and all trials. So, it, like, this is the tumor or the intended area to be treated, like the one on red. And then we treat all this with very high dose, kidneys, uh, bowel, all of that. And the patient will be will become very sick from our treatment. Then we moved, I mean, maybe from 2010 to what we call 3D conformer. better part, but still it is not the best. Nowadays, we use like the more, most sophisticated conformal treatment. This is, we call it the IMRT. That's the tumor here, and this is the dose here. All that's been saved, so the patient will have less side effect after the treatment, and also give us opportunity to increase the dose higher uh, than what they use here, like Portigray split course. Also, one of the issues is the pancreas is not stable. It is moving with the spirations. So sometimes the movement from up and down reach more than 1.3 centimeters. That means if like I, I see the patient and I plan a patient for a treatment as a snapshot, and then I, th I think you know that's the tumors. Uh, if I didn't add a good margin, then all my treatment is outside. And that's what we are telling about the quality assurance for this study. If you don't follow the protocol, you might either miss the tumor or you give very generous and cause a lot of toxicity. And by uh, to, for solution for that, we have uh, here the 4DCT. Uh, that's incorporated into, uh, into our planning. So... So for, for uh, all the patients with pancreas, lung, we do a specific CT called 4D CT in our department to assess the motion. If we found the motion is too high, then 
we need to control it either by active breathing control we can get the treatment under specific cycles for respirations or even better we can track the tumor by putting fiducials or markers inside the tumor and then the machine will track this tumor the whole tu the whole treatment also we have different kind of radiotherapy we have proton therapy nowadays and we have also MRI based LINAC where you have the MRI and the LINAC together so I can see the tumor live during the treatment and I change the treatment while the patient is treated so all this advanced technology is not in the future it, it is here now so uh, by just mentioning all of that that's what I think is not the, the data I presented before it's not, not applicable for contemporary i mean uh, technology now if we apply all that i mean the, for sure the result will be totally different from what i uh, what i what i present to you from the old data now i'm going to talk about uh, what wh what is the new directions in the pancreas cancer from our perspective uh, i see in the sprt as the light on that darkness so sprt definition is a precise focused radiotherapy deliver in small fractions of radiation in ablative dose. Usually we give it over just five treatment, three treatment, or even single treatment. Need very sophisticated treatment planning, very uh, rapid dose fall off. Also, you might see it in the literature as SAPER, SPRT, SRS, all meaning the same. Basic radiology, this is like a mathematical equation to show us uh, to relate the physical dose what like uh, what I mentioned here, 60 gray in 30 treatment. This is a physical dose, but in radiobiology, how effective to kill the tumor or to to do the the effect on the tissue? For that, it's, it's around 72. But now the same things. If I use the same dose, this dose, but I put it in just three session instead of the 30 session, all of a sudden I will have effectiveness of 180, and that's what. Uh, took us, I mean, to think about the SPRT. This is not something new. It's been for decades there from 1951, we treat patients with SRS, but to the brain, because the technology wasn't allow us to move or to control the breathing and it was very risky, but the brain is stable, no movement. So we treat a lot of brain lesions since 1951. Then the eye opening was result on the uh, early stage lung cancer in which as you see this local control nobody dream about it like usually our control was on the 50 60 and all of a sudden we achieve on the lung cancer and as you see see how the survival here on the lung cancer just on the time of introduction of SCPRT how it changing the survival very big time uh, for the lung cancer. That's lead to uh, the SPRT become standard in lung cancer and some of the liver tumors on also kidney tumor, prostate. So all those tumor that's become an integral part of their treatment. I'm here gonna just go through some advantages in well, This is one study compare uh, the conventional radiotherapy with SPRT in a cohort uh, patients. So we see here a significant survival benefit. And if you select your patient in the match pair analysis, the survival even better. Also, uh, by doing that, we have big aim here for the two major treatment modality, the surgery, if we do new adjuvant, so I will not delay the surgery because it's just five treatment instead of 30 days, I give five days only, I require one week break from chemotherapy before, and then after I give the radiation one week after, and then the patient can go for more chemotherapy or who he can go for surgery. So by doing that, there is no delay in the backbone for the treatment for bacteriatic cancer which is the surgery and then the systemic therapy. Also, this treatment showed less acute side effect, and that's also give us the benefit, as I mentioned, for the interruption of the treatments. 
but with some caveat that there is late side effect, we're going to talk about it. The <clears throat> here I'm comparing just in well done two studies, the alliance trial, as I mentioned before, and one large SPRT trial. The acute side effect here is 7%, and the acute side effect here is 64%. And that's what we see, like acute side effect is a non uh, noticeable, and it's, it's usually very easy treatment for the patient. As I mentioned, side effects, our side effects, which is the late side effects, that's the things we worry about from the SPRT perspective. This is the, is the duodenum, and that's our enemy. As you see here, the, the tumor is just wrapped around it. And we have problem from the duodenum. We can have bleeding, we can have obstruction, stenosis, ulceration, fistula, and perforations. This uh, now with the new techniques, the risk in the grade three is less than 10%. If we go to a grade four or grade five, it is actually less than 2%. The second organ here is the stomach, and that's especially for the tumor, which is on the tail of pancreas. Again, we have bleeding, ulceration, perforation as a late side effects. The third organ we have in proximity is a small and large bowel and also they share some side effects the same. And also like the all side effects here is maintained below, uh, maintained below 10%. We have here very interesting thing. We work with our surgeon called dose painting. Dose painting mean like here, this tumor, pick tumor attached here to the duodenum. And as I mentioned, there is a lot of side effect from the duodenum, so I cannot give the dose I want. But I know the surgeon is going to have positive margin, going to have positive margin here. So uh, dose painting, this area, I will give it much higher dose than the dose here. And that's the SPRT allow us to do this. So we do what we call dose painting, and this based on discussion with the surgeon where he expects the, like the positive margin gonna be, then we add extra dose. It's been done like for retroperitoneal sarcoma, they are bigger sarcoma, and when they, like the surgeon, expect there is an area that's gonna be a positive margin, then we boost a lot of dose in that area. And it was very successful without any side effect. SPRT and immunotherapy, and I think Dr. Ashwag mentioned that. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is also uh, like the uh, abscobal effect uh, there in the lung in melanoma, and we hope, inshallah, it's going to be also on the on the pancreatic cancer. Here also showing some of the data. Early data was single fractions. Single fractions was high side effect. Then we changed to three fractions, five fractions with good side effect and very good local control over one year. Uh, here is one of the biggest, uh, I mean, SPRT trial, 159 patient, uh, borderline locally advanced. See how the negative margin achieved is 97% with only 7% acute and late side effect. Okay. I'm just going to show you one case about like how we treat those patients. This is a patient with uh, liver. Uh, it was resectable, but the hepatobiliary surgeon thought because there is uh, collaterals, there is, uh, uh, sorry, portal hypertension, paresis, he is not surgical. So uh, he went for uh, induction chemotherapy by Zelox. And then we, he went for restaging. After that, we put a fiducials on the area for tracking. The fiducial can be by ultrasound, CT, or endoscopic. So here is our fiducials, two fiducials being there. Then we treated him with 30 gray in five fractions. So uh, this is the, the tumor in pink, and this is the orange is the intended dose. So it is very conformal, excellent. And uh, we use the saber knife, which is a robotic machine to deliver radiotherapy. I'm not going to go through it. So uh, the second case, we use it actually as a salvage after a patient treated in 2012 and then recur after 2015 in this area. So we give him chemotherapy and then we give SPRT to the area. And the third patient was actually borderline who received chemorad 
and receive chemotherapy to downstage him. This is after downstaging. And then he went for the surgery, but also he has a positive margin. And for that, we boost this positive margin with SPRT. And the patient is still alive, like more than a year now without any recurrence. She had some adhesion problem obstructions, which I think it is related to the surgery more than the radiotherapy. The futures, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Hamid, is the Alliance trial. It is uh, in the borderline. It is either chemotherapy or we apply SPRT here on the regimen. There is another one for locally advanced with SPRT as well. And there is 100 of them here. And uh, by that, uh, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.